Hello, good evening all guys. How are you doing this evening? It's the third live stream in a row. I told you I would keep my promise on this one. A live stream every day in December. That's what I call Streammus. If you see it in the uh, video title, Streammus for December. How is everyone doing? I, I can't actually see you so well at the screen because um, in front of the screen there is this great big um, microscope thing that is part of what I'm going to be working on first this evening before moving on to something more common on this channel. I'm so kind of like looking around the screen here. Third Era, cheers for the 499, buddy. Just dropping straight in there with a with the with a 499. First round of drinks on me, unless you are past round one. Uh, no, so no drinks this evening. Just taking it easy. Uh, I need I need full concentration on what I'm working on first uh, on on tonight's uh, video. Very, I need very fine motor skills for what I'm about to do first, um, which may or may not work. It's a bit hit and miss with the, with this stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, 13 BTRX3 says. Need more SQ videos from you. Yeah, okay. So um, I want to do a video of the Proton. Obviously, that's pretty much finished now. The front end is all done. Um, it sounds fantastic. Uh, nothing like I've ever heard before. The mid bass, the kick uh, intensity is crazy in the Proton with the T-Line door cards. Um, just, I guess, need some good weather now to do a video of it. The winter is terrible. It's just rained for like two months straight. So no point doing a video just yet. Um, and then there's some stuff I want to do on the card to tidy it up as well, ready for a video. And uh, that's all been put on hold this year because of everything. So there was going to be a video this year about the Proton, but it just hasn't happened. So I have to wait until uh, the, the weather improves a bit and I can get the stuff tidied up. Uh, what's up from Ohio? How's it going, my man? How's it going, my man? Okay, I'm glad you learned loads yesterday. That's pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, yesterday's video was pretty cool. Hey, doing the amplifier modification to that base face. Um, ha, jokes. Funny thing is, yeah, it turns out that the customer for that amplifier doesn't actually want to go ahead with the repair in terms of like, so that repair that I did on that base face, that would have cost more than just getting a replacement board. Um, the replacement boards for those are really cheap, like 70 quid. So the repair definitely costs more than that, so he's not going ahead with the repair. He's going to fit a new board himself. Fair enough, no worries. Um, so I guess that repair that I did for you on um, on uh, live stream number one a couple of days ago, uh, and the modification I did yesterday was kind of all for nothing, apart from just you, you guy, your guys' entertainment and education. But for me, I didn't, I didn't get anything out of it. That's not a paid repair for me. I just kind of did it. Uh, to show you guys, I guess, as a result, <laughs> but oh well, never mind. Uh, moving on, so this is something I'm working on this evening. Now, I have a different camera for you this evening, slightly different camera. So obviously we've got my main one that's pointed at my egg head, and then we've got this one, which is the my movable one, which I can sort of point down at the table. And the third one is usually the kind of big up top zoom in camera. But this evening I've got the HDMI plugged into my microscope. Um, so to start off, this evening, because this is just something I need to get out of off the workbench first before I move on to an amplifier. This is a Nintendo Switch console, and this is the EMMC, I think, chip. Uh, this is the chip which holds a bunch of, it's like a ROM chip, I think. It holds a bunch of data about this Switch console's serial numbers and its identity, and, um, you know, it, it talks to the other ROM chip on the back of the board. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like its identity, I believe, uh, or something like that. It's it's on a removable daughter board. Uh, let's give you this camera so I can sort of show you the layout. So this is a Nintendo Switch motherboard. Uh, we will get, be getting onto amps afterwards, but I just need to get this off the workbench first. So this is a Nintendo Switch motherboard, and this here is a removable EMMC, and that clips in there like that, um, and that's going to talk to data on this chip at the back here. Um, and if you swap these EMMC chips around. Um, from board to board, they don't power up. They, they're tied to a specific board. So basically this one that I've got in the uh, microscope here, uh, this one was blue screening. If you have ever, I don't know whether you would have, but if you've ever like looked into what problems happen with Nintendo Switch consoles, there's an issue that ca can cause the console to come on with a blue screen to start with. Uh, it just comes on blue screen and nothing else happens. And there's a couple of problems, uh, reasons that, that can happen. And one of the reasons is that the solder balls all sort of like mess up on this chip here and it needs uh, reflowing. I did a reflow of it earlier, so I reflowed it, all looked great, moved around nicely, but then I made the mistake because this, this stuff is super lightweight. So what I did is I moved, removed my uh, hot air gun and I blew 
on the chip to like cool it down as, you, as I do with the IRS 2844S chips and by blowing it the solder was still wet and it shifted and it, the, all the solder balls underneath got messed up so I was like oh damn it so now I have to, I had to remove the chip re-ball the, um, the underside and now we're just about to reattach it and see if it is actually going to work so BGA stuff is not something that I have huge amounts of experience with but I've done it a couple of times in the past with some success so as you can see here, this chip goes on here and this, the the pins or the balls underneath look like that. Yeah, absolute nightmare, right? So all of the pads there have tasty looking balls on them ready to go. And on the other side of the chip, we have a nice flat surface. It probably doesn't look it because of the lighting, but um, I've gone over that with the soldering iron. It's a pretty flat surface. Um, so I think we have a reasonable chance of success of getting this chip back on here with all the solder balls perfectly aligned and soldered. So what I need to do is turn my hot air station on, on a high heat, very high heat in, in fact, uh, and I need to get this positioned absolutely perfectly. Let's put some flux, let's get some flux on here. I'm going to use excessive amounts of flux here just, uh, just in case, you know, it's better to use too much than too little. Okay. I'm going to stick this down and try and get it aligned absolutely perfectly with where it should be. There's a little marker up in the top left hand side here that the corner needs to align on. See the tiny little circle top left needs to just align on that and then I need to have no vision of the, the circles on the left hand edge and I need to be able to see half of the circles on the bottom edge. So it needs to come down just a fraction. Okay. Okay, there. I reckon that is about bang on as perfect as we're going to get. Now when we do apply the heat, the flux is going to melt and it's probably going to shift it slightly. So all we need to do is just get it, try and hold it in place maybe or something while the uh, flux is melting to stop it from shifting so that all the solder balls melt and it stays perfectly in place. I hate doing, I hate doing this stuff. <laughs> Proton mid base is incredible. Thanks Adam, yeah. It's, it's, it's definitely something. Oh, I, uh, yeah. Yeah, we're gonna get onto the amps in a second, but I've gotta get this off of the workbench first. And it's, it's in the way and I just need to get it sorted and then we'll move on to the amps, all right? Alright, let's, let's hit the heat and see what happens. Just going to move this up a touch. Yeah, so you see how it's slightly shifting with the flux. Oh, nah, see the flux melts and it just kind of walks all over the place. Okay, I'm going to have to maybe try and hold it in place. so hard this is so tiny this stuff hate doing this stuff so I'm gonna turn the air pressure down a bit I don't think it needs to be as high as it is I think that might be part of the problem, so I'm just going to realign it back in place and then turn the air pressure down. You know what I could do actually? I could take some tin foil or something along those lines 
uh, and get it so that it holds it in place. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to go and grab some tin foil so that it holds it in place. One sec. Okay, got some tin foil. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of build, build a little castle around it to hold it in place, and hopefully it will stop shifting. And I'm not sure that's a good idea either, you know, guys. This is freaking hard, man. Um, okay. Okay, you know what? Let's just go for it again. Let's go for it again with less less air pressure on the on the heater. and release how are we looking okay guys that might have been it i saw it i saw it actually kind of click into place that might have been it i just needed to lower the air pressure on my uh, hot air gun it was blowing it around okay right i'm not going to blow on it because the last the reason i'm having to do this is because i rebought i uh, reflowed it and i i blew on it to uh cool it down and my my blowing kind of shifted it out of place so i'm just gonna let it cool for a sec that might have been it. We'll have to wait and see. I don't know for sure. This this Nintendo Switch was uh, blue screening, um, uh, and uh, this is the reason I'm doing this. You have to reball this chip, and it usually fixes the blue screen issue. Okay, that should be cold enough now. Yep, there we go. Okay. I don't have particularly high hopes for this. I'm pretty sure there's meant to be a gap there. So th th this is this is one that's um, original. Yeah, look, there's supposed to be a gap where you can see the solder balls. But in my one that I've just done, where, where, where did I put it? In my one that I've just done. I do believe that there is no gap there anymore. No, so it's right down on it. Okay, well, the only thing we can do is plug it in and see. This was a dead board anyway. Um, I only bought this Nintendo Switch for all of its accessories, so it's not the end of the world if it doesn't, uh, doesn't work. Okay, let's put my oops, put my uh, put this up up and away. Let's get this back on here for a sec.
Okay. Okay, let's find the motherboard that it was originally from and let's plug it into that and see what happens, see if it comes to life. So, here is the motherboard. That is the original one from this EMMC chip. Let's plug her in. Now, there's one of three things are gonna happen. Number one is that it has a blue screen again, which means that the problem wasn't the EMMC chip. Number two is that this uh, switch just doesn't show any signs of life whatsoever, in which case I bricked it, which is fine, it was dead anyway. Um, or number three is that the switch turns on and works. I do not have high hopes, but let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Battery is in. Let's hit the power button and see what happens. Blue screen, black screen, or Nintendo logo. Ah, blue screen! Okay, but that's interesting. Because that means we've just done a full circle to the original fault. Which actually means that my BGA soldering job there actually worked. Um, because, because... When this chip isn't aligned properly, or when this chip isn't soldered down properly, you just get a black screen, you don't get anything at all. This blue screen means that it's actually reading data from this chip, and um, it's actually trying to boot up, but there's some other issue on the motherboard elsewhere. Um, so, okay, yeah, the switch might not work, but I'm happy with that. I've practiced my BGA soldering, and um, that actually went better than expected. Even though we still have the blue screen of death, um, it means that the issue is somewhere else on the board. So that's cool. Okay, guys, let's let's move on to what you're actually here for amplifier repair. Let's put all this switch nonsense to one side and crack on with some amp repair, shall we? Get that in there. Get all that over here. Clean up my workbench a little bit. Making a bit of space for this big amp we're going to be working on next. Okay. Right then, ladies and gentlemen, amplifier time. What we're going to be working on this evening is this bad boy. Now, I have done a separate video explaining about these amplifiers before. Uh, how they work, how they're designed, etc. What's good about them, what's bad about them. But I, I, it's been a while since I've done a repair video on one of these exactly. So we're going to crack this open and see if you can learn more about how Korea are doing Fullbridge now. Um, I'm just going to plug my uh, main camera back in and disconnect my microscope that was plugged in a second ago for the switch stuff. Let's remove that from there. Uh, let's put it back into my main camera. Which is up here. And in a second, this should come back to life with the camera, with the correct one. And this camera is so zoomed in. I don't remember this camera being so zoomed in. There we go, camera's back online. It's very bright actually. It's a bit too bright, isn't it? Oh, there you go. So, zoom out a little. This is an amplifier under the brand of Vibe. Um, there are a few brands which are selling amplifiers with this same circuit design. One of them is Vibe, the other one is Edge, which is just a daughter company of Vibe. Uh, I've also seen um, this circuit design in brands, uh, amplifiers by the brand DS18. Uh, it's it's an amplifier coming from Zenon factory in Korea, so it's a Korean amplifier, but it is a full bridge amplifier. 
if you want to learn exactly uh, about these amplifier circuit designs, like what they did to design this circuit, then check out my video. I've done a separate whole video on these explaining about the circuit and stuff like that. But we're going to get to seeing how they fail, why they fail, and how to fix it. Ooh, stink. So this one's going to be a full rebuild by the looks of it. Okay. Let's get this bad boy apart first. I have someone, actually, I had somebody in the uh, live chat yesterday, very kindly offering to make me some, um, some special clamp removing tools. Now, I am not a, I, I generally am not so great at fabrication. Like, I don't have a... A grinder wheel or anything or I don't really have any sort of tools to work with metal or anything so I've never really made myself any tools before it's not something that I'm particularly interested in doing but um, this guy does I think and uh, yeah he very kindly offered to make me some tools to remove these clamps um, I've been doing absolutely fine for years with allen keys but sometimes especially in the um, larger Korean half bridges um, the clamps are so close to like the transformers even in this one actually we're a little bit close there to this capacitor um, and uh, you you know sometimes the allen key just is a bit too long um, and it's not the best tool really for removing these safely without kind of bending, bending other parts on the board like it is a bit tight in here but you can just do it with an allen key it's fine but having some proper de dedicated tools for this would actually be really cool so that's pretty awesome So in these amplifiers, nine times out of 10, they fail because the output section has been designed kind of poorly. The output MOSFETs in these are incredibly hard to drive. Um, and the drive circuit in these has not been modified from the old half bridge design enough to be reliable running these incredibly high input capacitance output FETs. So as a result, these FETs don't like being run in parallel with each other too well. And uh, you can get one or two FETs that tend to take on most of the work of the amplifier um, and they then fail prematurely. And they also heat up unevenly, even without a speaker connected. With no load, these output FETs can heat up um, quite considerably. So uh, there, there's definitely, definitely some design changes that could be made to these to improve their reliability. The idea of these you know the, the general circuit idea is fine like I see what they're doing here I see what they're what they're trying to do and you know the, the components that they're using are actually great the heat sink is fantastic um, they're soldering the MOSFETs to these kind of heat spreaders which also isolate electrically that's fantastic there's lots of things that they did right um, but there's a few things in terms of the uh, circuit design that they actually did wrong which is a shame because they could have been really crazy bulletproof monstrously powerful small full bridge amplifiers but just a few things let them down and they're actually assembled really well as well like in terms of vibration damage i i honestly can't really see see any issues from vibration coming from these things they're screwed down all the way through the middle there's there's absolutely barely any board flex whatsoever um, the transformers and stuff, although they don't have like loads of silicon on them, the way that because the, they're smaller, they don't tend to like wobble around as much. Um, they don't tend to sort of shake or, or vibrate as much as the bigger ones do. Uh, these ones have loads of silicon on them. Where they're bigger, there's loads of silicon under here, preventing that from vibrating around. They feel absolutely rock solidly planted to the board. So yeah, I can't really see any vibration damage issues commonly occurring with these which is a good thing. I still wouldn't recommend you mount it to the box though, but you know, if you're gonna mount any amp to a box, this one's probably the one to do so. going on in the live chat evening guys let's see what you guys said about the um the, the switch shenanigans there
Do, 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 do. The Nintendo Switches are actually yeah, one of the worst um, worst designed uh, consoles. It's so unreliable. So many things go wrong, wrong with them. Yeah, that's what I've been doing for years as well, Mitchell. I've just been uh, using an Allen key for years. <laughs> Yeah, this is a Korean board. Yeah, Dean, this is a Korean full bridge amplifier coming from Zenon factory. So the same factory that produced all your DC, 10K, Sundown, old school SCV and uh, SA, I think the SAZ were Chinese most of the time, but the SVC, CV were, were Korean. Um, there's a couple of factories in Korea that were generally made most of these amplifiers. Um, Zenon being one of them. Zenon made all of the LW audio amplifiers and they are fantastic. Um, so yeah, the, the, the factory and the build quality is really good, but this circuit design was rushed into production to try and, um, get on the hype train for full bridge and, you know, high efficiency and better modern components, smaller size, high power density. Do you ever work on musical musical equipment like bass guitar amplifiers? Nope, I don't. Uh, I don't personally. I tend to stray away from mains equipment for now, but mains powered amplifier repair might be something that I dive into at some point later down the line. You know, perhaps if car audio dries up a bit, could dive into the home audio stuff. Um, what always put me off about repairing home audio amplifiers is so with this car stuff, because the car amplifiers have a low voltage power supply. So you, you're feeding it with 12 volts and um, then volt, you know, rail voltage builds and that powers the amplifier. Um, and obviously with a 12 volt bench supply, you can limit the current into, and because it's a switching power supply as well, you can really turn the amplifier on slowly and you can really, um, kind of watch out for any potential mistakes or anything that you've missed in your repair and you can see it before the amplifier explodes into a ball of flames but with mains powered amplifiers because you've got to feed it with like in this country 240 volts ac even if you current limit that just the fact that there's such high voltage there means that you don't really get any time. You don't, if there's something still wrong with the amplifier or there's something you missed or there's a short somewhere, you don't get any time before everything just catches fire. It's just, it's, it's so much more dramatic and scary working on mains power stuff than it is car amplifiers. Um, but it might be something that I look into in the future. I've had a few ideas recently about how to, you know, more safely kind of power up mains powered amplifiers. Um, I, I well, someone actually, um, I think it might have been a comment on one of the uh, one of the YouTube videos that I've got, and some guy said, "Oh, hey, what you should do is when you're working on mains powered amplifiers, all you need is you just need a bunch of um, bench power supplies, like you know, current limited power supplies. You need maybe like four or four four separate bench power supplies. You set one of them to like your five volts or your plus minus five volts. You set an another couple of them to like fifteen volts plus minus, and this is going to be all what's dry, what what voltages are generated inside these amplifiers to run the op amps and the preamp section and stuff. So most amplifiers will have like low voltage uh, rails in them to run the the chips and the preamps and stuff and the drivers. So five Five plus five plus minus five plus minus fifteen or twelve volt reference rail and stuff like that. Um, that's all the same as in car amps. So I can have a bunch of bench power supplies that generate all of those voltages, and then I can have a high voltage bench power supply that's current limited um, that I can use to create virtual rail voltages. So with a home amplifier, what I could do is I could completely disconnect the whole power supply board from this home amplifier, the thing that takes 220 or 240 uh, into rail voltage, disregard that completely, and just power up the output board on its own with these bench power supplies. Now that might that might work for older amplifiers that don't sort of like talk to each other with data and stuff with the power supply section for protection circuit and stuff like that. Um, but I'm, just, I'm thinking some modern amplifiers that might not work because it will it will detect that the power supply board isn't there and there'll be sort of signal feeds and sort of data lines for activation and turn on and protection and stuff like that that you just can't really replicate with external power supplies but it is definitely a, a, a food for thought and something that i might consider in the future doing kind of home stuff pa stuff um yeah, there's definitely a lot of guys repairing PA amplifiers that I would say have less general understanding about a kind of amps and electronics than 
than uh, some of us do here. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe I've just been put off by it because it's high voltage and kind of scary. Maybe I should have another go at it, but we'll see. We'll wait for the car amp stuff to die down a bit first. Okay, so I'm just kind of removing this from the case. Now, these amplifiers, um, usually you, I remove the, the power supply side out comes, slides out first. But in this case, this amplifier actually has a uh, Tiffany style RCAs, which just take ages to unscrew. So rather than unscrewing the Tiffany style RCAs, um, I actually just remove the plate from this side and pull it out from the power supply end. Secondly, like, like this, just need to uh, screw down the terminals because they're getting in the way. What DSP are you running in the Proton? I, I'm actually getting a whacking in a Zapco um, processor for the Proton, I, I believe. Because what basically with the Proton, um, I am bypassing the head unit entirely, so I'm not running a head unit. The my my music source in the Proton is my mobile phone, which has lossless uh, audio tracks on it, flax and WAVs and stuff like that. Um, and then basically, I have a topping D10 DAC, so I plug my phone in through USB-C to the topping T, uh, D10, DAC. That that basically, my phone then sends the uncompressed file straight to the topping D10. And that's not actually converting it into, the topping D10 is just kind of a middleman. I'm going then from the phone, uh, USB, is sending the file to the topping D10. The topping D10 is then converting that file into optical. So it's not compressing it or changing it to analog. It's just making it optical. And then I'm going optical out from the topping D10 into the Zapco processor. And so the processor, and only the processor, is converting the raw digital uh, information into analog audio ready to be processed. Well, actually, well, the, the DSP will process the uh, audio in data form first, I think, anyway. So, um, yeah, the only the only uh, DAC, the only digital to analog converter that, ex that will exist in the Proton build is just gonna be in the DSP and it's gonna happen one time. So we're not converting from analog to digital back to analog again um, through various different sort of uh, processors and, and head units and stuff. It's just, just going from digital to analog one time as the final step before the amplifier. Okay. So what can we gather from looking at this amplifier then? I'm going to zoom in a little bit, change the camera angle slightly. Okay, spinner ruby. So, power supply section then. Um, it's actually been proven by a few different um, amplifier sort of design, res design research guys that having multiple smaller transformers, like these are baby little transformers, having multiple smaller transformers and having only one push-pull MOSFET per transformer actually seems to be more reliable than having just one huge transformer here doing all of it. Um, sharing the load, you know, multiple men sharing the load, maybe each one has higher headroom, which then equates to a much larger headroom if it was spiked. Um, but yeah, it's good to see this um, used. However, that is, on the contrary, <laughs> saying that, the fact that this, this should be more reliable, we have a very, very smoked up power supply section. So if this was more reliable, then why is it all smoked up? Well, my friend, I will tell you why the power supply dies in these all the freaking time. Oh, it looks nasty, right? So when these power supplies die, these MOSFETs, these IRFP7530, these are absolutely beast MOSFETs. These are crazy, very, very low resistance, very, very high current MOSFETs. Now, the problem is when these die, because they are such low resistance MOSFETs, when they die, they present an incredibly low resistance to the short, you know, to the 12 volts that's coming in. So when these fail, they fail hard. They absolutely cook up and burn everything. Um, so these fail very, very dramatically. Now, the reason that these have all failed this evening, gentlemen, is, yeah, I think I've got a bit of that MOSFET in my mouth, like it flicked up the soot. 
um, little, 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 probably gonna get cancer now, uh, is because of the output section. Now, I mentioned earlier that the output sections in these are not designed particularly well. So the fact that the power supply is completely smoked up, I am willing to bet that we have dead output MOSFETs. Let's have a look. This side, we have no dead MOSFETs on this side. How about the other side? Oh, oh, oh snap. No way, this is very rare. Oh wow, okay. That's, <clears throat> oh, I, def I definitely did swallow one of, I definitely did swallow a bit of carbon from that MOSFET. <coughs> Oh shit, hopefully that's not going to kill me. What, what have I just eaten? I've eaten like burned epoxy, carbon, um, probably some silicon. <coughs> what, what happened was I, I, fl I flicked a, I flicked a, I was like doing this and I, it flicked and it went ping and it fired up some like junk and I was talking at the time and it went in the back of my throat. I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, but this is very rare. Okay, so it seems that we only have a blown power supply section on this amplifier. Now, what I was going to say is that nine times out of ten, the reason that these amplifiers have blown power supply sections is because the output MOSFETs will fail because they are designed poorly and they run inconsistently hot with each other and one of them or two of them will be doing most of the power compared to the others. And so one or two MOSFETs will fail. So then the amplifier will go... Usually, the amplifier will then go into protection mode because the output MOSFET fails, therefore it sends DC to the speaker terminal, which then the amplifier detects the DC at the speaker terminal, says, oh hell no, goes into protection mode. The user then is like, oh, why is my base cut out? What's going on? Might be even be driving at the time. So it might then just turn off the head unit and turn it back on again, which will power down and then power back up the amplifier. And when the amplifier powers back up again, it has a shorted MOSFET in the output section. Now, depending on how that MOSFET has shorted, it will most likely be creating a short circuit across the rails. Now, if it creates a short circuit across the positive rail, then the power supply section will explode and become overloaded because there is no protection circuit in these amplifiers that prevents the power supply from just dumping infinite current into a shorted rail, uh, a, you know, a shorted MOSFET while it's being powered up. The only overcurrent protection on these amplifiers is on these rails here. So we have some little kind of um, resistive bars here, R10, R87, and just over here as well. Now what these are doing, I think are these on the uh, low side drain? I think these are on the low side there. Yeah, these are on the negative rail. Yeah, so these, all that these are doing, these are just measuring the current across the speaker output. So these aren't measuring the current like going into the rail voltages. So if you've got a shorted MOSFET, then there's nothing to detect over current on that bit. So while the amplifier is trying to power up, it's just going to completely blow the power supply section. Um, and that is, well, it's just, just poor design. Like why, why wouldn't you have the amplifier, you know, check current across the rails as it's powering up like brazilian amplifiers do this brazilian amplifiers have um, a health check mode before they power up fully and the amplifier then checks to see whether rail voltages are able to be built first before turning on fully but this amplifier doesn't have any of that stuff so it just kills the whole power supply section but in this case we don't have a dead output section it seems well just from preliminary tests um, there's no dead output mosfets all seem to be reading okay which is very strange because these power supply sections, these are built really, really strongly and they don't generally die like on their own without having the output section fail. Like it's quite rare for this to, for this to fail just from being overloaded, you know, being clipped or being driven too hard. Um, they're, they're, they're very strong power supplies. So I'd be interested to see after we've repaired, after we've replaced, you know, removed all the MOSFETs, I'd be interested to see if there's like a shorted transformer or something that would have caused this to fail like this. Really, really interesting. Okay. So let's start by snapping off all these old MOSFETs because these are dead. Absolute toasted. Don't need those anymore. I might actually just cut these. It'll be a bit quicker.
Okay, so all the MOSFETs have been removed from the board. So nine times out of 10 as well in these amplifiers, when the power supply MOSFETs fail, the drivers in the middle of the board here will also fail because the pull down resistors across them are too high, which means that they, they, they end up just sort of kind of sinking that current to ground. Now often these PNP drivers, the A1023, which is the PNP driver, this will visibly burn up. Uh, but in this case, it doesn't seem to have burnt up. A1023, that looks okay. The C part is the NPN. C part is the NPN, A1023. These visibly look okay, which doesn't mean that they are okay, but it potentially means that the amplifier didn't, you know, fail too badly, uh, didn't send too much of that current to gate. Um, one interesting thing you can sometimes tell with these amplifiers when they fail. So if we look at the way that the MOSFET failed, you can see here that the burning sensation happened on the uh, source leg. The source leg has ground and the drain leg has 12 volts from the battery. So if all of these MOSFETs have failed in the same way, they have, you can see there that all of that current from the battery has been used up and has been used to cook this ground leg on all of these power supply MOSFETs. So hopefully there's a high, there's a high chance that we didn't get much 12 volts current going back down the gate line towards the drive transistors because it was all being used up cooking up all of this stuff. So there's, there's possibly a chance then that the drive circuit may have survived in this case and it may not be damaged. Another telltale sign to know whether your drive circuit might have survived is the condition of the gate resistors. Now obviously everything here looks janky as hell because it's covered in soot from the MOSFETs exploding. So let's just spray some isopropyl alcohol, isopropyl alcohol, just kind of like brush some of this away. And another telltale sign which you can use reasonably reliably, especially with these amplifiers that have low value gate resistors, if the low value gate resistors are not burnt, in this case we have 10 ohm gate resistors. If these are not burned, if you don't find any burnt gate resistors, then chances are the drive circuit is also fine. If the drive circuit got hit and got cooked up, then often it will burn the 10 ohm gate resistor going to the drive circuit. This side, all the gate resistors look beautiful. They look absolutely fine once we clean, cleaned away the soot. Um, let's have a look on the other side as well. So I think I think this could be you know just as easy as replacing the power supply MOSFETs, provided there's no like burned coil like transformer or anything like that. Yeah, all the gate resistors on this side look beautiful as well. Okay, that's promising. So it could just be a case of new power supply MOSFETs. <coughs> I'm really scared about that bit of MOSFET I swallowed. Like I I really scared about that. Because that's like carbon, man. I don't want to eat that shit. Uh, I'm kind of worried about that. It's just in the back of my mind, like, yeah, I just munched on some broken bit of MOSFET that burned. Anyway, not what you want to do. Uh, so, now that I have removed the MOSFETs and cleaned this up a little bit, the next thing to do is to apply some power and see whether the drive circuit did actually survive. So let's plug in our power supply wires here. I'm gonna have to open these up a touch to get the wires in. Get the remote in. There we go. Okay, cool. Let's turn the scope on. The scope wasn't even on yet. That's quite rare. Usually the scope is one of the first things to come on when I hit the workshop. Man, these comments are cracking me up. I love the live chat. It's great. <laughs> yeah, like sweet corn. Now I'm hoping that's what's going to be. And I'm, I'm not going to absorb all this like carbonized like silicon and epoxy and God knows what. Okay, scope is on. Let's hit the power supply. 
just very low current. I'm only going to allow 0.5 amps into the board because we're not driving any MOSFETs. We're just like looking at the drive circuit, which doesn't require any current. Okay, cool. So it's not drawing any, it's not, there's no leakage. There's no current leakage. Zero, zero point zero amps. Uh, before we hit the remote, let's just go across. Actually, what the hell is going on? Recently, check this out on the scope screen. Like, it never used to do this. So I have this noise on my scope, which wasn't there before. Like, that's never been the thing. But recently, I get this noise on the scope. That, that's, that's like a grounding issue. Why, why am I getting this noise here? Where's that come from? Uh, I wonder if it's something to do with my microphone setup. But that, that never used to be there. Anyway. So let's just make sure that there isn't any um, DC. We don't want any DC on the, um, on the gates here. There's a touch of DC there, but I think that's just because the... Yeah, that's just because the uh, the uh, isopropyl alcohol I used is ever so slightly conductive. That's fine. Because I haven't got my 99 stuff in yet. I've only got my 70%. Uh, yep, that's okay. No DC on that side. No DC on that side. So now let's fire it up and see if we get a nice cheeky square wave there. Oh, oh dear. Okay, okay, no square wave, just DC on the gates. Uh-oh, something smells hot. Woof, something smells real hot. Let's get the thermal imager out and see what smells hot. Something smells hot just then. <laughs> Could be the drivers. I imagine the drivers probably are toasted. Remember I said that they don't look bad, but they can still be bad. They're probably still toasted. Nine times out of ten, the drivers will die in this case, but I'm surprised because the gate resistors looked okay. Although, actually, no, it, it can't be burning because it's not it's not drawing any current. We're still at zero zero point zero zero amps, so it can't be burning because it's not drawing any current. Okay. Okay, so we have no square waves. We just have three volts worth of DC on the gate. Okay. Let's have a cheeky probe of the uh, TL494 and let's see what we've got on pins 9 and 10. So the, re the, the thing that's generating these pulses that should be on the gates right now is the TL494 chip, which is on this drive board here. TL494 chip is situated here. So we just need to probe pins 9 and 10 and just see whether we're actually getting any square waves coming out of that. You know what? We're actually not. The TL494 is giving straight up DC. Well, that's interesting. It could also be though that the drivers have failed and they're, they're, they're sending that DC back, but that's not, usually even when the drivers are screwed up, you'll still get the PWM on the TL494 because there's a high resistance, but there's, there's usually a high resistor, uh, value resistor between the TL494 and, um, and the uh, drivers here. Okay. Interesting. Now, before we go, before we start pulling any parts out of this, let's flip the board over, flip her upside down, and let's just do a um, a diode mode reading using the multimeter on these drive transistors to make sure that we don't have any leaking or shorts before we go removing anything. So the the drive transistors are all here. I've got the eight drive transistors on the board here. So let's just have a check and see what we have on the multimeter. Shouldn't have any shorts, should just have nice high value numbers here. So let's see what, let's do that. There we go, that's a much better view, isn't it? Looks good. We're looking for like over 300 on the, on the screen here at all times. Okay, that's fine, that's just backwards. There's some current lingering. Yep, that's fine. That's also negative, that's fine. Okay, interesting. Doesn't appear to be any shorted drivers just yet. Okie dokie. So the drivers could still be leaking, don't get me wrong. The drivers could still be bad, but we've we've removed the possibility that they are completely shorted. Um, so this is, this is interesting. This is interesting. I wonder 
whether we have an extremely unicorn occurrence where the TL494 chip has actually failed, which which would kind of marry up. So this, this amplifier is already strange in the fact that the power supply section failed and the output section is fine. That doesn't usually happen in these amplifiers. The power supply section usually is completely bulletproof unless the output section fails. And what we have here is we have an amplifier with a, a perfectly fine output section, but a completely smoked up power supply section, which as Adam Francis in the chat rightly said, it could have been wired up backwards in reverse, but I didn't see any other telltale signs of that. Um, usually there's some stuff along the drive circuit that, that fails when you do that. I didn't see any telltale signs of that. Um, and like, the drive circuit itself hasn't like the gate resistors are all fine so 12 volts hasn't gone back down through the drive circuit so i'm wondering did the tl494 fail and turn all the fets on at once with that dc at the gates and kill the power supply fets which caused them to just blow source to drain interesting <coughs> Interesting. Yeah, uh, Adam, I haven't in my whole time ever repairing amplifiers, I have never ever had a TL494 be damaged by the drivers um, blowing. And that is because there is high value resistance between pins 9 and 10 and the drivers. So even if the, even if the drivers have like 12 volts on all pins, um, the TL494 isn't going to care about that because there's a high value resistor between the drivers and the pins. Secondly, I actually don't think that it's a problem for the TL494 to have 12 volts on pins 9 and 10, like fed back from it. I, that, I don't think that will kill it due to how the, um, the way that the transistors inside the chip itself are, are laid out. I think that would be fine. But uh, yeah, so I think then guys, the first thing that we should do with this amp is possibly replace the TL494. I'm curious to see whether that actually changes anything. Hmm, okay, let's do it. Let's 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 change the TL494. Really cool. Don't really ever have to do this. So pretty cool little opportunity here to do something that you don't usually do. We'll preheat the board a little bit here to help get the driver board out. Wow, thank you for the uh, 5,000 somethings. Dude, thank you very much for the donation, man. Massively appreciated. Um, I can't read the comment, unfortunately. Does anybody want to translate that for me real quick? Sam, are the SCAR SKV2 reliable? I don't know. We don't have SCAR in the UK, unfortunately. So I don't have any hands-on experience with that amplifier. I don't even know what the guts look like. I'm gonna send a picture of the guts of that amplifier to my Bearvids Facebook page, and I'll tell you um, whether that circuit design is, is, is known to be reliable or not. But yeah, we don't, have, we don't have loads of brands in the UK. I don't have SCAR. Don't we, we sort of have Rockville. There's a few Rockville stuff floating around, but not massively. It's just a quick way to remove the driver board in this case, because the, the driver board here for the power supply section uses really, really tiny pins. So often the solder sucker just, just doesn't suck any solder out because the, the gap's too small. So this is just a bit quicker, a bit more reliable way of removing these. There we go. And she's out with no pulled veers. Not a single, not a single sausage. 
Is there a UK brand of amps? Yes and no. Um, Vibe is a UK brand of amplifiers, as is Edge. Um, but, you know, the amplifiers themselves aren't UK. They're not made in the UK. Um, they're, you know, made in Korea or and whatever. And they are the same circuits that you'll have in other brands in other places in the world. Like, for example, this amplifier shares a circuit design with DS18. They, they have an amplifier that has this same circuit in it. So, um, yeah, there are some UK uh, audio brands, uh, but they, they're not like bespoke. They don't, they don't do anything that other brands... Oh, I just found the problem, hey? <laughs> I just found the problem. Actually, you know what? This is the second amplifier of, of these that I've come across this issue. So check this out. The, these pins are no longer attached to the board here. Vibration damage, my man. Vibration damage. Always vibration damage. If you're ever wondering why your amp has failed, it's probably vibration damage. So yeah, this 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 uh, driver board has been like blah, 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 wobbling around, flexing around, and it has just metal fatigue stressed these legs, and they've all snapped. It appears that only the ones on this side have snapped, which is cool. Which means that it probably only would have fatigued these ones. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply some solder to all the rest of them. Um, they feel really strong actually though to be fair all the rest of the legs feel really really strong So I don't think we need to replace all of these headers because uh, these these are really small pins I don't think I have any replacement um, ones of these uh, Pin headers for these so we're just gonna drop some replacement pins in these four or five uh, Strengthen these up with solder and put it back in the board and see if it works. I imagine it probably will Hippopotamus <laughs> says, Hey Sam, can you explain uh, how the Synergy amps uh, is full bridge but not strappable? Um, yeah, it may just be that they decided not to um, officially include a way to strap. Maybe they just decided they didn't want their customers doing that or the amplifier wasn't really, I don't know. They just decided that they didn't want that feature. Um, but if it is truly a half bridge amplifier, then you will be able to strap it or bridge it with another one. Um, if it doesn't have that availability that feature built in then you just have to do it externally which is pretty easy you can do it just need uh just need to invert the phase of the signal of uh, the second amplifier and connect the uh connect the load across the uh, positive terminals and connect the grounds together but it's easy to do provided it is like truly a, a, a half bridge Did anybody translate the uh, the Chinese the the this this message? Oh, five five thousand yen. He says you're hot. Really? Really? South Korean won is the currency, and it was three pound forty. Nice, thanks, Adam. Did he really say that I'm hot? What soldering iron have you got? I'm going to send you some tips. Oh man, I appreciate that. You don't have to do that. The, t the tips for this soldering iron are really freaking expensive. Um, this is a AOUA uh, 2738A. AOUA 2738A. And uh, yeah, it uses the tips that have the heating element built in. So they're, they're quite expensive. I think they're like, I don't know, 15 or 20 quid each or something like that. Maybe a bit more. Can't remember exactly. I, uh, I have so I am ordering some new tips for this soldering line, um, but they are out of stock 
at the moment from what I've seen unless they've been restocked like today. Uh, I'm just going to grab some um, component legs to rebuild this driver card with from the drawers, the drawers of many, many things. Here we go. Helps if I remove the old snap legs first, doesn't it? Ooh, there's me trying to shove it in when there's already old legs in there. He said, I love engineers. Fair enough. Cool, cool. Well, thank you very much for the 5,000 yen, if that's what it was. Okay, cool. Now let's put some new legs in this baby. Fresh new legs. Christmas legs. The lighting for this camera is really bad actually. Uh, I'm pretty I'm sure pretty sure I remember the lighting used to be better for this camera. Uh, what can I do about that, I wonder? Uh, inspect Logi. Here we go, this one. Let me see if I can make this camera a bit nicer to look at. Um... <laughs> That's funny. 